I am. Here's a, here's a mic that then you pass to G. And then you need it. For, for running around for questions. Okay. I probably won't even use it, actually. But she asked me to wait a few minutes. I think it's being, it's being recorded, though. So the song might be Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, coming. I, I want to welcome the students and the faculty that we have here, uh, the alumni, guests, staff. Um, I greatly appreciate you coming to what is the sixth annual Barry Hom lecture, a named lecture for uh, a man that I knew quite well, uh, who was here at the beginning of the uh, executive MHA program, Barry Hom. Uh, he was a longtime healthcare administrator uh, in Duluth for most of his career in other parts of uh, northern Minnesota, uh, but did some teaching on the side, and then toward the end of his career, uh, he decided that he loved teaching so much that he went back uh, at, at an advanced age uh, to get a PhD so that he could spend his time teaching. Uh, and so when we started the executive MHA, um, he was part of the team that helped put it together. And he was the uh, finance faculty, uh, a beloved finance faculty, for the first two cohorts uh, of the program and, and helped us put together the, um, the curriculum, uh, which the students here in the room uh, today still uh, mostly based on the, on the curriculum that he put together on the finance side. Uh, Barry unfortunately got sick, pancreatic cancer, um, and uh, had surgery and was not well following the surgery and passed away. So uh, we named this lecture in his honor. Uh, like I say, it's the sixth uh, time that we've been together. Uh, and we hope that you enjoy uh, the lecture today. Uh, to introduce our speaker, we have the program director, Gene uh, uh, Abraham, who all of you, everybody in the room knows. Uh, so thanks again for coming. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Tom. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Tim Beebe, um, who will be our speaker today. Uh, last August, uh, Dr. Beebe became the head of the Division of Health Policy and Management, uh, in which the MHA program is housed. And prior to joining the faculty, uh, Tim served as the chair of the Division of Healthcare Policy and Research and director of the Survey Research Center at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, Tim received his bachelor's degree in psychology and biology from Bemidji State, a master's in applied social research from the University University of Michigan and his PhD in sociology from right here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Tim works on a number of issues um, with interests in particular in focusing on kind of methods and developing and testing measures and evaluating new data collection 
uh, to improve care delivery. And so we are really fortunate to have Tim here today to share with us some of his work on integrating the power of patient reported outcomes measurement in patient care. So please um, join me in a round of applause for Tim Beebe. Thanks, Jean, uh, and thanks, Tom. Can everybody hear me? Um, I appreciate uh, um, being invited to, to present today, and, and uh, Jean had mentioned that I'm, I work on a lot of issues, and some would say I'm, I need to work on even more issues. Um, so uh, again, I, just a, a, a quick uh, nod to um, Barry Holm. I, get, I never knew him. Um, but I, I, I know so much about him th through all the people that have been was for, were fortunate to work with him. Um, you know, I think uh, we all aspire to have an impact on our friends and families, but I think few of us really reach the level of having a, a, a macro and sustained legacy impact, such as, as Barry has had on on us, and 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 speak have people speak to about him in such reverential terms. I'm very honored to be uh, invited to speak uh, at a lecture that um, bears his name. Um, so thank you for the invitation. And speaking of that, um, I was looking at our, the previous presenters um, here, um, including you know, uh, Mark Werner from Medica, Ed Ellinger from Commissioner of the uh, Department of Health, Scott Parker um, from Intermountain, Don Wegmuller. Um, I'm, and I just have to ask, um, Tommy, what, what were you thinking? I mean, why, why did you make me follow these you know, luminaries and, and health and healthcare glitterati? I mean, you guys are going to be so disappointed. Um, so. Um, there's one. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, we're number five. Yeah, um, kind of the chant for uh, the Minnesota football team. So, um, uh, so thank you for uh, inviting me today. So, uh, um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, uh, integrating the power of patient-reported outcomes into patient care, and I'm going to refer to it hereafter as as PRO or PRO. Um, before I move on, I want to uh, thank. Some, most, most of this work had, was done when I was at Mayo Clinic. I'm, I'm still uh, continuing that. Um, but I do want to shout out, uh, make a shout out to my collaborators, Dave Eaton, um, Jennifer Ridgeway, Jeff Sloan, and Kathleen Yost from Mayo, and Jeanette Ziegenf was from Health Partners. Uh, for further reading on this, uh, here are a couple of, most of what I'm talking today is discussed in, in actually more eloquent terms and in, depth, in greater depth in these two articles. So if you want to like check out right now and, and just kind of um, uh, read those instead rather than to listen to me bloviate, um, you're more than welcome to do that. But if you do stick around, uh, uh, here's what I'm going to cover today. Um, what is a PRO? Uh, what are some of the properties of a good PRO, not just generally, but also within the context of their utilization within the clinical context? Um, the vision for pro data collection and patient care, different models of pro use in, in healthcare, um, implementation considerations. Who, I mean, who who ha in this audience has had a chance to or interacted with like a PRO data collection system at their healthcare organization? So a few of you. So I'll probably call on you once I get um, uh, to a later point to, to get your experiences because I want this to be someone interactive. Heidi and Megan, I think, have have microphones. So if you, uh, I want to be. A little more interactive on that point. So I'm going to pivot then a little bit more toward discussion of a, an instrument that we developed at Mayo Clinic that called the Mayo, I don't know how in the heck we came up with it, but the Mayo Clinic PRQOL, the Patient Report Outcomes Quality of Life instrument, um, and talk a little bit about how, uh, what, how that um, was designed and, and its potential applications. And I'm going to talk about the, the, uh, its utility and, and potential use within the population health perspective, specifically the accountable health communities sort of perspective. So I probably don't, uh, well, if you have a burning question, ask it. Um, I hope I have time for Q&A, uh, um, but if you have a question, just raise your hand um, as well. So what is a PRO? Most of us know what this is, but I want to make sure we start off the same page. Uh, it's a measurement of any aspect of patient's health status that comes directly from the patient without any interpretation from a clinician or a caregiver. It comes directly from the patient. Some examples include function physical function, social role function, uh, symptoms, intensity and frequency, satisfaction with care and medication, well-being and quality of life. Well, some of, what are some of the properties of a good PRO? Um, it's simple. It's really cast as like at a sixth grade level or uh, a, the level of a 12-year-old. Um, fortunately, I'm kind of stuck in that uh, cognitively and, and emotionally in that age, so that's why I'm such a good designer of these instruments. Um, 
Um, the, the, t the items should be jargon free. Um, the response scale should be uh, intuitive and the instructions should be clear. It should be very brief, especially in the clinical context. You know, no more than 12 to 15 minutes. The uh, instrument that I'm going to discuss later on is uh, three to five minutes long on average to complete. It's informed by patients. Oftentimes, uh, the priorities of the patient don't necessarily comport or align with the, the priorities of the, of the physician. And so in, it's in development. It, it had to include um, patients in its development. I'll talk more about that at a couple places in the, in the um, um, discussion today. Uh, it's reliable. It's, uh, it's reprodu reproducible. It's consistent and stable over a period of time. It's valid. It measures what it's intended to measure um, and nothing else. And it's responsive to change. It's, it's sensitive enough to capture clinical changes in a patient post-treatment or over the course of um, um, the condition. It's easily and immediately scored and interpreted. Um, it predicates clinical action and decision making. So it has to really yield um, actionable results um, within the clinical context. So when I talk about the power of PROs, um, I'm really talking about the vision of PROs as a vital sign um, uh, of equal importance to the clinical profile. Um, envision coming in and in the intake and the patient has a clinical and biological profile but also um, is fortified with patient reported outcomes information, things like function and quality of life and, 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 and the like. Uh, it can actually be used, it's, it can actually be used to kind of maybe um, preempt care um, or like prehabilitation or prophylactic interventions, you know, like if they have fatigue, uh, uh, exercise or um, nutrition and the like. It can actually inform the types of treatment and how well it's working. Um, how, and I'll talk about this more when I talk about the models, you know. Is this treatment working for them in terms of some of the uh, patient important outcomes that the, um, were ascertained? Ultimately, it's uh, intended to reduce emergent care and the research shows this, um, um, improve survival, improve quality of life um, when and applied and collected in the clinical context. So there are a number of models of the use of PROs in patient care. Um, uh, this one uh, is, uh, this model really is more like a screener, um, identifying problems or issues that may not have otherwise um, come to, uh, to light um, in a clinical encounter. Uh, it's basically, um, you know, moving from, and I'm going to try to do the laser pointer here. Pardon me if I have my back to you. So, are you okay? I mean, you're going to make fun of me? Um, all right. So, uh, you ask the PRO and uh, it's fed to the clinician, um, alerts the clinician to the problems, again, uh, around quality of life, function and the like. The clinician intervenes to treat the problem and the severity of the patient, the problem uh, decreases. It's entered into the EMR. It's basically case identification and problem identification. It's very linear, it's very clinician focused. It's an oftentimes just a one or two shot thing. Um, a second model is a little bit different than that. This one is more focused on uh, routine management um, of care um, of the patient. So uh, there's a regular assessment of PROs. Um, the, it's the PROs fed back to the clinician and the PRO data is used to determine whether treatment is working. So the main question in this model is, is this treatment working for this patient from a, a function and quality of life perspective? Um, the decisions are based on, you know, on the results of that, you know, do they maintain treatment or curtail um, or change the treatment plan. Ultimately, again, the goal across these models is to improve patient outcomes. So, as is typical in presentations, the final model is the best model. Um, this is kind of the Goldilocks model. It contains uh, the best of both, both of them. It, it, it focuses on um, uh, uh, case identification and um, uh, uh, it helps direct patient care, but it also helps monitor care. But more importantly, it brings the patient into the, into the equation. Um, it, it helps ascertain uh, patient important outcomes. It engages and activates the patient um, in shared decision making. So basically, just running quickly through this, you know, regular assessed, assessment of PROs um, is fed back to the clinician alerts the clinician to the patient problems and it prompts a discussion. This is where the activation of the patient takes place because of the, based on the information that are ascertained from the PROs. Clarify the patient priorities, again, what's important to the patient. And again, when I talk about the instrument that we developed at Mail, that I'll talk about later on, um, this is an important aspect of that. The patient becomes more involved in care decision making. Um, again, 
and it brings about higher self-efficacy, the whole sort of shared decision-making movement to try to activate the patient more as a consumer and engaged partner, and greater adherence if, they're, if they feel like they're part of the decision-making, and which then leads, again, to increased satisfaction, um, improved outcomes. So those are the models, and again, this is the model that we've used um, when I talk about the instrument later on, it's, it's really what we've used to frame um, uh, the development of that. It's, it's really to try to have, uh, to ping all those salutary aspects and the virtues um, that I just described. So there are a number of implementation considerations um, when you're thinking about uh, implementing PROs in clinical practice. Um, again, how you respond to some of these questions really uh, impacts the form and function of the system that you deploy. Uh, I'm just kind of covering these in, in the, uh, at a very superficial level. They're, they're discussed more in detail in those two articles that I, I offered um, at the outset. So what's the purpose of data collection? Is it just for clinical care, clinical quality, or is it also for research and performance measurement? Sometimes if it's trying to do the two-fur and the three-fur, it's hard to do because there are different requirements that are associated with those different primary, primary goals. Um, sometimes research quality um, uh, data aren't uh, co uh, collected um, when it's just largely for clinical care or for um, performance measurement. So you really have to decide um, the purpose of the data collection. Um, what are the system design considerations? How involved are patients and providers uh, in, in the design of it? And how often do you uh, go back and what are the feedback loops to look at feasibility and usability? Uh, what does the web look like? Web interface look like? What does the system look like? Oftentimes, um, I've heard, um, or sometimes, um, these systems are developed really without um, a lot of input of the, the clinical uh, care practice and, and, and really don't work well in the practice because it doesn't map onto the, the speed of the practice. And, and, and they often, and they sometimes fail because of that. How will data collection occur? And this is kind of, um, this is my nerd work. Um, so what sort of mode of, of data collection is there? You know, a lot of these PROs, the existing PROs were developed to be collected by paper um, um, back in the dawn of time when paper was the norm. Um, uh, um, but, you know, increasingly there are a number of virtues of, of moving into to electronify those collections. You know, it, it's automatic data entry. Um, it it's, uh, uh, allows itself to, for immediate scoring, some of the things that I talked about earlier on. However, um, moving from one mode to another has some challenges. And so we have a grant um, with colleagues at Mayo Clinic where we're comparing paper-based versus tablet computer-based versus uh, interactive voice response systems. Does there, any, anybody know that, what that means, the interactive voice response? It's where um, patients call in and it's an automatic um, um, voice, uh, it's a voice that reads the question and, and on the phone they, they pick the response. And, um, and we wanted to see how, uh, A, you know, the patient receptivity to that, this is an oncology and it's multi-site with um, multiple cancer centers across the country. Patient receptivity to those different forms, how does it impact the measurement qualities um, of these different um, scales? Um, and uh, um, what are the, how do the scores differ? And we're finding that uh, what, you know, patients don't like the IVRS. They don't like the, the, uh, the oral and, and, and um, administration. They like the visual. And they actually kind of prefer the paper to the, the tablet. So it really, how the choice of how you collect this, these data really impacts the, the quality of the data. Um, so when, when do you collect it? Do you collect it before the clinical encounter, during the clinical encounter, um, or wait till after? Do you collect it uh, while they're at home? Do you collect it in the waiting room? Do you collect it in the, in the exam room? So these are all decisions that um, you have to make um, when you're considering implementing a PRO data collection system into clinical care. What PRO instruments will be used? So um, when I talked earlier on around um, ability to measure change in, the, in, in treatment, uh, you know, there's a, there's a choice between a generic kind of general health care, health um, status assessment versus a disease specific. Um, oftentimes the, the general health um, status measurements are too coarse. They don't pick up, they, they, they don't, they're not sensitive to pick up on the signal um, in the changes. Uh, on the flip side, the disease specific are too constrained um, to a general population. So you have to decide whether it's general or disease specific. 
if it's a single item or multiple item, whether it's a static form or dynamic. Um, there's this whole, uh, the Promise Initiative uh, Patient Reported Outcomes Measurement Information System has this computer adaptive testing. Maybe your kids have taken tests where it's computer adaptive where the next question is based on how well they did and it gets increasingly hard. Um, it's based on that, so it's very dynamic and tailored to the individual. Um, do you want it static or do you want it dynamic? Um, so there are a number of different questions and one of them is um, the, the, the tr trade-off between scope and brevity. Um, so physicians want only that, the information that they can act upon um, that's relevant to the care that they think that uh, they want to care, deliver, physicians and, and, and other healthcare providers. Patients want to talk about more things. And so, uh, you know, the, the trade-offs between scope um, and, and brevity are, are, are challenges that, that we have to make all the time. I'll talk a little bit about that when we develop this instrument later on. Um, who will review the data and when? Does it go to the physician? Do the patients get a copy of the results? Does the care team um, get the information? How do you act upon it? And getting back to the, 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 one of the virtues of PROs or one of the aspirational um, aspects of it, you know, does it produce actionable results? Um, does it, um, are there clinical pathways associated with the information that, um, that, that's delivered? And how can scores be interpreted easily and make clinically relevant? So do higher scores on these PROs, are, is that better or worse? Sometimes the valence changes based on the, on the scale. Uh, what's the, the threshold for a diagnosis or, or caseness? Um, oftentimes these short scales are screeners. They're not diagnostic. So you know, at what level does it mean that, you know, like the PHQ-9, which is a depression screener, you know, at what level does it mean that they probably have depression? Um, um, you know, so you have to identify when, when you need to act upon um, the, the information that the PRO provides. Um, patients want normative information, meaning they want to know, is this normal? I mean, is this, what, what do other people like me look like? One of the uh, studies I did when I was at the Medicaid agency was developing an adolescent health review which measured 14 different risk behaviors, um, like substance use, alcohol use, um, uh, uh, suicidal ideation, um, sexual abuse, things of that nature. And there, the, the items came from another study I worked on. There was the Minnesota Student Survey, which is a census of all students in fifth, eighth, um, uh, and 11th grade in Minnesota. So every three years, it's collected on every student. And so we use that information to kind of say, you know, for uh, a kid, you're a, 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 a young male, um, age 14, here's what it looks like. Because oftentimes they'll go in there and think, um, well, I drink, I drink, but it's, you know, everybody drinks this much. And then we would show them the profile and kind of have like a you are here dot like you get in the mall like when you're lost. Um, um, and they'd say, wow, you know, this isn't normal. This is... A lot, of inf a, a lot worse than my contemporaries. And on, on, the, on the, uh, the PRO side, you know, a lot of this, a uh, number of the instruments like the, um, uh, did I scare her off or something? Um, <laughs> so, should I have welcomed her? I'm, um, so, um, you, know, they want, you know, they have normative information for people with diabetes and, and different conditions. So they actually know, like, is this normal or not? Is this within the, within the, uh, the realm? Um, uh, also, like, what's, um, what's a clean, clinically important change in these scores? You know, if it goes from a 9 on a linear analog scale ass assessment to a 7, is that bad or not? And so there's a whole sort of mathematical way of looking at that, uh, you know, like a third or a, a half standard deviation change. But more importantly, it needs to be indexed off of what a clinician um, what would think is meaningful, how would they would act on that, that change. And that really is a, an iterative and inclusive process. So those are some implementation considerations. I just kind of want to pause here for a, a minute and, and ask um, some of the people who have had experience with this um, what sort of challenges they've had or successes uh, along these lines. And, and um, don't, be, don't be scared uh, to, to chime in. I really want to know because Everybody seems to want to do these. There are very few examples of successful um, and robust and sustainable implementation of this. So there's a promise of the power, but um, um, oftentimes it's not. So I'm mean, kind of interesting to hear from those of you who are in the trenches and have worked on these things. What are, what, what are some of the challenges? Is this an inclusive and exhaustive list, or 
are there things I missed or, or you know, maybe it's not as hard as I'm intimating and that you should come up here and talk. So I think that uh, physician buy-in is a huge issue. The, if these uh, um, forms are being filled on paper, they are just buried, buried in the record and no one looks at them. Even if they are being done in the electronic medical record system, still it's very hard to bring it to the physician's attention and then we have the information which is never acted upon. Thank you. What, what system are you with then? With? Uh, U of M. U of M, okay. Anyone else want to share? <coughs> Uh, hi, my name is Andrea Nahuffa. I work in uh, clinical research and regulatory affairs at Medtronic. We use patient reported outcomes all the time in clinical trials. And so they're incredibly useful tools to understand both to the things you talked about using a disease specific um, PRO and then one that's more generic. But often they make tremendous difference in the utilization and adoption of therapies. So we have one study that we did, and if you have it very focused on what's important to the patient, it makes a huge difference. So we've seen adoption of therapies increase by 15% when you just focus on the patient reported outcome. Thank you. And, and that raises an interesting point around um, the patient important outcomes. Um, I've I chaired a, a couple of study sections for PCORI, um, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and the, the review criterion a very important one is, are you focusing on patient important outcomes? And how have you gone about ascertaining that and documenting that? Um, because the, the, so if you, if you, if you, if you um, um, subject uh, this sort of undertaking to um, a bunch of nerds like I was raised, um, actually, I know it's surprising, I, I, I am a nerd. I, <laughs> you, see a, you see an urbane sophisticate in front of you, but I'm not. I I'm, 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 I'm went to Bemidji State. Um, so. Um, you know, our tendency is to kind of adhere to how we're trained. You can't change items. You can't clip items. You know, otherwise, you're going to ruin the psychometric properties of, a, of an extant scale. Um, so that usually means it's all additive. And so these, these instruments are just unwieldy. Um, and, and, uh, and it's really kind of agnostic to really what is this, the primary uh, of primary importance to the, the patient and to the physician. You know, what is absolutely necessary to direct care um, and what uh, does it offer over and above your typical um, information that you get. So it's very vitally important. I mean, if PCORI survives um, um, the next uh, um, few months, I mean, I think that that's important to always consider and it goes back to my point of including patients and, and physicians in the process. Go ahead. It is. And so, thanks for bringing that up, and thanks for um, you earned the money I paid you for saying that. Uh, uh, people say, you know, it's impossible to collect patient-reported outcomes or PROs in the clinical context, but pain has been around forever. I mean, it's just axiomatic. You just ask that question a, a lot, and um, uh, and uh, so it can be collected, and it shows up in the EMR. It shows up in um, it, and it probably shows up in your. Are you a clinician? All right. So. I mean, uh, it shows up in your discussions with your patients. Um, you know, how would you rate this today? Or if it's a kid, you know, what smiley face, you know, do you point to? Um, so that's a PRO. And so if that's collected routinely, you know, why can't you roll more into that? So yeah, that's a PRO. And that's if it's directing um, uh, patient care. Again, it's an augmentation to the typical clinical and biological um, profile and information that, that um, again, so the, the vision is to have it as part of just another vital sign that you track over time. One more, then I get, then I'm taking over again. Uh, Lori Wilkowitz, I'm actually with Boston Scientific and I use the, these type of data when we do um, consulting with our clinician customers. And I find one of the biggest challenges or resistors is, um, it's, especially for the clinicians, is they, many of them see it just as information for information's sake. So they don't just want you to tell them, you know, now here's your score. They want you to tell them what to do with it. So I'm curious your experience at Mayo, if you actually took the data and went that far to say, you know, you're more successful or the, you know, the outcomes or the cost is 
outcomes are better, the quality of life is better if you yeah. do X, Y, or Z. Because I think that's where I find the frustration. It's like, well, I appreciate you giving me this information and doing this, but now what do I do with it so it doesn't cause me more risk as a provider? That, again, another, another shield in the audience. I actually going to talk a, a bit about that because that's one of the biggest barriers. So thank you for that. Um, might as well end on a high note and go to the next slide. Um, so uh, I'm going to pivot here and talk a little bit about the instrument that we developed in, at Mayo Clinic. Um, this was part of the, uh, the Beacon grant that we had from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. People, have people heard of Be Anybody heard of Beacon? Okay, so it, it was basically to try to um, bring together uh, uh, in a seamless way multiple different types of healthcare systems within a catchment area to share data seamlessly, electronically and the like. But one of the things that they wanted to do and one of the things that was proposed was to develop a, a tool um, that enhanced patient-centered care and diabetes, that sort of third model. How does it uh, enhance uh, patient-centered care by the use of this instrument? Moreover, we wanted to help make social determinants of health a routine part of pa patient care. You know, you know, so the things like social and economic de things that uh, determine care, you know, uh, place of residence, culture, gender, uh, race, uh, the built and social environment, um, uh, familial and extra familial uh, uh, support, uh, health behaviors and the like. Uh, you know, the, there, there's an increasing consensus of the importance of looking at the social determinants of health. However, it's hard to really routinely collect this in clinical care because of time. It's hard to get this information um, within a, a, a visit or in the clinical visit context. And there's some attitudinal um, um, barriers as well, and I can talk a little bit more about that later. This is driving me nuts. Everybody knows I'm Tim, right? Okay. Um, uh, so um, getting to your point, how do, we, um, how do we develop a tool that provides information that healthcare providers value and know how to act on? Um, clinicians, um, physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, nurses, um, physician assistants, um, are bombarded with data. Um, uh, a lot of it's superfluous. Um, they don't know how to act on it. Um, and, uh, um, and, and really, there's no, some of this, there's not a known clinical pathway. And so it's like, thanks um, for more information. And, and so we tried to get hit on all those cylinders, but we also wanted to do all of these things with a brief instrument something that could be rolled into clinical care. Um, and when we pushed ourselves even more, what if we could only ask one question? I know, madness. Um, so, um, so what we did, and so I said, you know, the importance of including um, patients and providers in the process, we actually talked, walked the walk um, on this. We had three phases of provider and patient uh, um, inclusion. So the first part was developmental. We had uh, three groups of physicians and three groups of um, patients where we ask these sorts of questions um, and they were tailored to be patients too but what information is most important to you when making decisions about the course of treatment and care what information would you like to get that you're not currently getting what information is most helpful to you in determining whether your patient's health status has changed since the last time you saw them and imagine you could observe your patients with diabetes in their daily life but not in a creepy way um, what information would you hope to gain? <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't ask that part. But um, what information would you hope to gain that, uh, that would inform their course of treatment of care? So we asked those questions. And again, we had three groups of both patients and providers. Um, so it was a very protracted process, but incredibly beneficial. And this is what we came up with. So it was clear from the provider side, they wanted one question. What is your biggest concern? Again. They wanted to focus on the issue that was emergent or, or relevant at that time. Um, and so that's what it was indexed off of. And so these groups also identified a number of different areas that were important to them. And this is actually the interface of the, of the instrument as well. So I'll kind of walk you through this a little bit. So personal relationships, um, talking about family and friends, monitoring health, this is their actual diabetes, testing blood sugars and testing, uh, checking feet. Emotional health, um, whether sad, anxious, or have other emotional concerns. Money, the cost of medicine uh, and paying for care. Health behaviors like diet, exercise, and sleep. Medicine, um, taking medication and managing side effects. Health care, their health insurance um, and access to care. Uh, work, their schedule, environment, managing their health at work, um, their physical health, um, and then something else. So uh, what this does is um, kind of really 
broadens the array of things that can be discussed within the clinical context. Um, uh, having this visually laid out to say, this is okay to discuss this within this clinical context. And people were, patients were surprised that um, this, is, this could be grist for the discussion mill. Um, so what they would do, and it was, a, it was on a tablet, um, they could like uh, pick one of these. And I demanded as a methodologist that it actually, what, it sounded like this. Beep, boop, boop, beep, boop. I mean, so that's a very important methodological nuance to this. Um, so what they could do is, uh, what's the biggest concern? Um, they could hit physical health, and it drilled down a little bit. We just had like a small collection of, um, really this is, again, as methodologists and psychometricians, um, it really got us out of our comfort zone. You know, we're trained to ask the questions as they were designed. This is an amalgam of different uh, scales that we had. Um, and basically, it just drilled down and add a little more specificity by what they meant by physical health. So for each of those tabs on the xylophone, um, uh, again, getting back to this, uh, the back, including patients and providers, we had two other phases of, of review. So we had another group, three physician groups and one patient group, um, looking at are these relevant domains, and so we, we tweaked it based on that. And we had another one, final one, looking at this interface, whether or not they like this xylophone, and what, more importantly, whether they like the beep, boop, boop sounds, and that was really satisfying for me. So, um, uh, so this is really kind of getting at what's the problem that's emerging today. This is really looking at um, directing care and case identification and problem identification. We wanted to be able to do re routine monitoring too. So we asked of everybody, irrespective of what they said on the xylophone, uh, questions uh, like this linear analog uh, scale assessment, looking at general quality of life. Um, we also asked them for it because it's a diabetic population diabetes-specific quality of life, and I'll talk about that when I talk about the report. So this, we collected everybody on every visit so we can monitor care over time and, and, and do some trending. So as important as it is to, to include physicians and patients, or clinicians and patients at the, at the front end, getting back to how they use this information, on the reporting side too, it's, it's equally important. So this looks pretty busy, but the patient and providers would get this, this uh, layout, and we tested this with the, the patient and, and provider groups as well. So what you see up here in the upper left is what they selected at that visit. So if they selected money, it comes up with that same sort of visual um, identifier. And you know, it, then it kind of gives the d details um, of what they said. We also look at uh, provide um, uh, past uh, results. So you can see here um, in the past visits, this one at the time it was money, before it was uh, health behaviors and then physical health and then um, family uh, and personal problems. So there's a visual identification of what it has been over the course of treatment. How have these problems manifested themselves over time? We have a general quality of life um, tracking. Again, uh, the research shows that patients um, and providers like longitudinal data they like easy to interpret graphs, and they like to be, their eyes to be directed to those areas that are clean, clinically meaningful. And we tried to do that here by, you know, it's longitudinal. We have red asterisks if it's clinically meaningful and maybe generate a discussion. Um, so we had general quality of life, uh, physical uh, functioning, emotional functioning. Um, these are kind of general um, pain and fatigue. And these are diabetic, diabetes specific, kind of pulled again from existing diabetes quality of life measures. Um, this gets back to what you were saying. Um, so this is new information for a lot of clinicians. You know, I don't know if those who, who you've gone through nursing school or medical school know how to, how to uh, deal with someone who brings up questions about um, health insurance or work. Um, uh, so uh, there was a lot of resistance um, um, to this from providers because it's just they don't know how to act on it. You know. I mentioned that Adolescent Health Review um, um, uh, instrument that looked at screen uh, uh, risk behaviors. Um, two barriers. So when we wrote the grant, a large R01 grant, we had all these healthcare providers saying that they wanted to participate. We got the grant, and only one person wanted to do it because they like I don't. The the, the groups uh, pushed back, and the lawyers pushed back. 
We don't want to ask this question because if there's not documentation that we did something about it, we're legally liable. Um, so there, and, and plus there was an attitudinal barrier, like I mentioned before. Um, I don't want, uh, um, I know I've seen these kids their whole life. I, I gave, you know, I delivered this kid. Um, so they're, uh, I know about these kids. And so when we actually implemented it, they were surprised to know that the kid was bringing a gun to school every day. Or now I understand more why this, this young woman is always wearing loose clothes because she's being sexually abused at home. So um, there are barriers to this and then uh, to, to deployment of this, but it actually confers a fair amount of benefit. So here, the, it's hard to read this, so I'll kind of um, expand on this. So the suggested clinical pathways, I'm using the term very broadly here. Each item set has a suggested clinical pathway or action to be taken by any member of the healthcare team with this movement toward care-based um, delivery or, or team-based delivery. Um, they know what to do. So sometimes they're just website links. Um, again, the patient gets this as well. Or it's actually uh, ref uh, information that helps direct them. So like if they say uh, financial problems, you know, and the, the, the real drill down is problems paying medical bills, pills cut in half, skip dental vision or mental health due to, due to cost. Um, you know, there's a little xylophone up in the upper left. Um, they say these things. And this is a f nameless, faceless person. Um, uh, that would uh, part of the care team, you know, has a number of different options, and those are all manifested in the report that they get here. You know, they could uh, provide web links, they could review supportive care needs, contact financial services within the healthcare system, refer to local support groups, discount programs, uh, contact community financial aid, review meds, or alert case manager. So there are a number of different clinical pathways that they can take based on each one of these. It was imperative that we, for every bit of information we collected in this form, we had what to do with this information um, um, available to them. So some, we, uh, we've deployed this in a number of different places. Um, in the, uh, we had a number of different sites for the diabetes um, um, application of this is well received by patients and we had it was like in, uh, we did it in, in Maine and in uh, Utah. Well received by patients, providers, increased communication, streamlined referral and resource allocation processes. Interestingly, I mean these were very chronically ill uh, uh, diabetic patients while also, also multiple mor morbidities. The main thing that came up was money. You know they were concerned about finances. You know and, and that came up because we asked the question you know, um, so that was a surprising finding. We administered in palliative care in, in Arizona and Florida at Mayo Clinic. Um, fought, again, it fought, found to facilitate important discussions between the patients and physicians in areas that would not have been discussed. Again, problem identification, things that came up with, um, what, that would not have otherwise come up in the uh, clinical care context. Um, again, we pre-tested the, the bejeebers out of that thing. Um, uh, Pain and anxiety within the palliative care population were the most often primary, uh, um, uh, selected primary concern. We de uh, deployed it in the surgical suite as well uh, for patients under COVID GI cancer um, resections. Um, physical and health and nutrition were major concerns. The, major, the information helped individualize prehabilitation programs for patients undergoing new adjuvant chemotherapy. And programs tailored to uh, individual concerns decrease stress and improve physical fitness. So they use the information from this tool to actually inform what sort of prehabilitation um, um, protocol they deployed for each of these patients. So I, 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 I put these out there because um, A, it kind of shows that it's a potential applicability to different patient populations. I feel like a salesman. Um, um, you too, you know, can get them. But, um, but also, you know, how these different people, what, what's on the minds of the different patient populations, you know? Um, the things that were reported most often were surprising, not only to us, but to the, 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 the care teams as well. So we think it, it has a, a strong application in this whole context of population health. Who has heard of accountable health communities? I don't know if you've run over it all during coursework. Um, the CMS Innovation Center um, uh, offered a fund funding, funding announcement um, uh, testing the accountable health community model. And basically it's what, assessing whether systematically identifying and addressing health-related social needs can reduce health care costs and utilization among community-dwelling Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. And it requires comprehensive screening for social needs like housing needs, food and security, utility needs, interpersonal safety, and transportation difficulties. Um, 
Um, and the, pur the purpose of collecting this information, getting back to the clinical pathways, is to link them to community assets um, that may be actually stronger drivers of their health than um, some of the other things that may be typically attended to in the clinical context. Um, we submitted a grant. We, I mean, I'm not at Mayo Clinic anymore, right, Gene? Um, when I was there, we submitted a grant. Um, it's, it's reviewed date has been kicked down the road a couple times. It's not going to be reviewed in April. It was supposed to review, be reviewed um, last October. But, um, um, but anyway, so it's the, the, this tool is the centerpiece of that. Everybody coming into the clinical context takes this, and there's not only just a care team that directs care, there's a, uh, we've activated a network of um, community health workers to navigate that, to see how, they've, um, how they do. And we've facilitated uh, a lot of electronic health record exchange between Mayo Clinic, Olmsted Medical Center, as well as some of these community agencies um, like uh, Olmsted Public Health and the like. Um, so we're waiting to hear about that. So I think it's pr particularly relevant to like a population health perspective where linking primary care and pu public health more formally um, and more systematic through the, the deployment of something like this would, would be helpful. So um, that's, um, let's see here. I'm running out of juice here. Not, I mean, I'm not, um, this is. Uh, <laughs> So that's, that's all I have in terms of a formal presentation. I'm, um, you know, what are some of your reactions to this? Uh, not only just this last instrument, um, although I I'm, I'm really would like to see this deployed more um, systematically, but just generally the idea of collecting data on patient report outcomes in the clinical context. I'm wondering if this is an agnostic tool or can it be embedded in any health record? Uh, how, um, how easy is this to deploy within an existing health record? It's very hard to deploy within an existing health record. The biggest barrier that I even put up there that we ex encountered, getting to your point around um, having it part of the EMR, is the IT portion of it. You know, how do you get this, not a wraparound to the EMR, um, but actually part of it, so in, in, in a visually actionable way. Um, you know, clinicians are getting alerted to death, right? You know, a lot of decision tools, a lot of, um, you know, for this person, it's, you know, here's the drug interaction, the drug reconciliation in real time. There's a lot of information in, in there. Um, but the biggest barrier is kind of, um, anybody from IT here? Like from the IT world? Well, okay, the, the person behind the camera, so just plug your ears. Um, <laughs> the biggest problem is working with the IT group to figure out how to do that. Now, so like Mayo Clinic's moving to Epic, and Epic is actually rolling a lot of um, um, uh, capability to collect PROs into that um, system. The problem is it's that it's, there's like a, um, who, who's familiar with Epic? Um, yeah, so it, it, you can like pick, I want to do the SF36, I want to do the Promise 10, I want to, and it just concatenates them. It just kind of aggregates them. So it, it gets back to, it, it turns it into this kind of gnarly looking instrument that you, know, you really can't collect routinely. Um, but the idea is, is appropriate, where the results can, um, sometimes it's a PDF of their responses, sometimes it's an actual a synthesis of their information, um, but at least Epic is, is, is set up to try to collect that. It's, it's kind of kludgy, um, but historically what we've found in, in any sort of um, a deployment or a development of a pre-RO collection system is the IT. It just, it's, we're not on the top brooding platform list of things to include into the EMR. Your tool with the sort of xylophone qualities has a really app-based feel. Did you work with app designers to, to develop that aesthetic? Yeah, a really smart grad student. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, a medical student down at Mayo Clinic who designed this for us because I, we weren't, IT wouldn't return our calls. <laughs> So I work more in the, uh, I'm an anesthesiologist, so not in the primary care field, but I think we use these type of um, PROs for a lot of research and acute pain. And you brought up the pain scores earlier, which is a patient-reported outcome, but it's actually very poor, and it doesn't work well, and it doesn't 
do things. So we look at quality of life or quality of recovery or functional outcomes that are really great, but the tools that are available are very minimal. And that's part of the issue is trying to find a good tool that's validated that we could use to then bring it back to our patients. We're developing a study in C-sections and there's nothing with C-sections, but patients could care less about how much Tylenol they take or how much opioids they take, but they probably care about, well, maybe I, if I do this, I could get back to carrying my baby earlier or right. breastfeeding easier. But we don't have any of these things that are out there, which is part of the, I think, a big part of the problem and the amount of time and money or research putting into developing these. Right, I think that that's the challenge in terms of like identifying a good pro, a PRL. I mean, they're existing scales. There are scales that can be morphed um, within, within a, to a different clinical context. Um, but you raise an interesting point um, around, you know, the, the, the value of pain um, versus these other things too. And so the, the, the paradox, as I'm sure you see it as a, as a clinician, um, you know, you look at their clinical profile and these people should be miserable. I mean, they, uh, they have multiple drugs to take every day. They are, the side effects are debilitating, yet their quality of life is high because you're getting at the social role function. I can still, I'm, A, I'm still here. I can still make it to my daughter's wedding. Um, so that's the importance of, of trying to get at these things that are patient important, it, um, trying, to, to, trying to calibrate it so that um, it's really relevant to the sort of patient population you have. So, again, one of the things that we did a lot at, at, at Mayo Clinic is our consulting services to try to help uh, different clinical departments identify um, instruments that are relevant um, for their clinical need. Again, you know, not if you're going to be doing this in a clinical context, you can't have a bunch of pointy-headed PhDs going in there and 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 saying, use these. Um, you really have to say, you know, what are your needs? What do you want to find out? Kind of those questions that we ask the providers. What are things that you want to know that you don't typically get? Um, if you could follow them around all day in a non-creepy way, you know, what do you hope to ascertain? You know, starting from that and then right-sizing um, the, the PRO collection to that need, that demonstrated need. Um, and then setting a, chilling out a little bit and so it's not the whole SF36 or the SF-12, it's the SF-2, or, you know, I mean, so again, trying to find the appropriate uh, PRO requires um, finding the appropriate partner that understands how these could be deployed within the clinical context. Yes? So to kind of tail off of that point, um, your, your overall thesis is that the, the data from these, these data from the PRO drives, drives uh, clinical decision making and, and is, it kind of helps the provider and patient engage in the, the encounter. I wonder how um, this approach stacks up against some of the other clinical decision aids um, like the, the works that are done by Drs. Montori and Shaw, mm -hmm. which kind of uh, facilitates more active engagement between the, the patient and the clinician versus collecting data beforehand and, and using that to guide the conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I think, you know, collection of patient reported outcomes um, feeds into uh, um, the deci shared decision making discussion that you have because you're trying to get at um, what's most important to you, you know? Um, and when you discuss in the context of the shared decision-making tool, you really should start out, you know, so treatment A, you know, this drug will um, make you, it will uh, impact your diabetes, but it may actually help you lose weight, but it's injectable. You know, so uh, you really are trying to get at what's important to them. So um, uh, I worked with Victor uh, on this, on this and, and we tried to roll in a lot of, uh, um, the information that, were, that was pulled from this and tried to roll it into the shared decision-making tool he came up for diabetes um, within this. But, you know, um, if, you, if you're interested in talking about uh, the social impacts of this, um, you know, uh, um, that's part of that's grist for the discussion mill. So they're not mutually exclusive. They're actually uh, very much married together. Hi, Mary. Good to see you. Um, I, I'm fascinated with the, the rise of the the electronic medical record and what it's going to do in the long run. I think it's fantastic. I think we're way behind. Um, there was a study done, just my point, there was a study done this summer, a survey of active physicians in the state of Minnesota uh, on their, uh, it was around resiliency. Number one issue, use of the 
automated medical record and how difficult it is for their practice. And, and what I have hope in is that the information that's gathered will, will be usable and give them hope and give physicians the information that will help to uh, turn their tide, if you will, toward the use of the automated medical record and actually see the value of using it. So that just a sort of a comment on yeah, how I, they I can think, come together. And I mean, I, 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 I'm not familiar with this study, but I, I know from experience done it at Mayo Clinic in terms of the burnout surveys, um, the clerical burden is one of the big drivers of that. And I think one of the, one of the things that EMRs are, have tried to do is everything, you know? They just roll more in there, um, rather than being kind of strategic of what are the main things that a physician or a other form of clinician needs to, to do care within that context. And distribute that cognition throughout the rest of the care team. So like when I talked about the vision of this, collecting the PRO data, and, and it may never make it to the actual physician. It's, it's you know, they're, they're turfed off, that's kind of a tough, kind of a coarse term, but turfed off to public health or finance. I mean, if it's really what's driving them, it's really on the front of mind, you know, it's actually focusing, and, and, and so uh, the clinicians are working at the top of their certification um, uh, rather than doing all these clerical things. The whole idea around like scribes and, and all that stuff are the same sort of idea as pulling away all this stuff that had been wrapped around a, a busy clinician schedule, um, kind of disaggregating that and disambiguating that a little bit more, and, and so they can f focus and use the EMR for those things, I mean, I, I've been talking with the, the clinicians on I mean, clinics, like, they get alerts all the time, you know? Just be, after a while, you know, the first time you hear a bell ring, you kind of look at it. It's like a car alarm. Um, you know, the first time you hear it, it's like, I should probably do something. The next time, it's like, would someone turn off that damn car, car alarm? You know, I mean, so after a while, you become inured to it, and you lose that information. So. I think that you know, clerical burden is a huge driver of burnout. Um, it drives, it pulls clinicians from actually offering clinical care. And I think there might be a pendulum swinging to you know, not having everything in the EMR um, in terms of in front of center of the, the physician. Because there's also a lot of ethnograph uh, ethnographic work saying f patients don't like the fact that the, the clinician is folk look at doing this, talking to them. Not face to face and we you know Victor has done a lot of uh, uh, videotaping of uh, patient provider interaction and it, they're just shocked when when the physicians look at this uh, and say I, I never made eye contact with the patient at all so I think there's I think there's a, a movement away for you know with the advent of click care teams and kind of distributing the cognition a little bit more to other members of the team and utilizing PROs to maybe Try to do things in advance of, of the actual visit, or actually, they, you know, when I talk about collecting this information remotely, they only come in if there's like a downward canting in quality of life, as opposed to just automatically coming in. Um, so, long-winded response to your excellent comment. Patrick Cuffey, Cohort Seven. I do a little bit of work with Epic over the years and with uh, uh, EHRs, and it's some interesting thoughts. I would agree that uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, problems with how we've implemented them. But I'll offer the perspective of the person that's kind of stuck in the middle between um, the... You're not IT, are you? Uh, okay. I'm a CMIO. Oh, uh, uh oh in between, the, in between the clinical side and the IT side, I guess I serve as a translator and a physician informaticist in that realm. And what I would offer in working with Epic is they basically do what we ask them to. And we don't speak with a unified voice as clinicians. But I've sat in rooms and voted on enhancements that have gone into Epic systems. And they have implemented what we've asked them to. So our prioritization and what we do is based on what we tell them. And they are a representation of that. The one derailer over the last few years to that is Epic took a multi-year uh, pause in their development cycle because of meaningful use and because of the sheer number of requirements that were thrown at them from the software to do certain things. And most of us that work in this realm would say that there's not much meaningful about meaningful use. It's caused a whole number of issues and forced EMRs into environments where they have not been ready to be deployed or developed. 
So um, the, the field of uh, physician, or, or rather I should say clinical informatics and having physicians and nurses and other healthcare team members involved in this and serving in this role uh, is a relatively new field. And I would encourage everybody to get to know the people at your sites that do this work, communicate your thoughts, and uh, help get those thoughts to the developers because I can assure you Epic and the developers are not the issue, we're the issue, and we're not speaking in one voice. Thank you. Are we running a little bit out of time? Uh, another, one more question, Tom? One more. Tom really likes controlling the time. Right here, down in front here. Um, I like it. All right, that's a way, that's a way to end. <laughs> I mean, I get emotionally excited when I saw all these buttons. You know, my simplicity is the most complicated thing. Mm -hmm. And you made it simple. Thanks. So I like it. That's it. You know. Good. Now, all right. You're going to be our spokesmodel. The worst part. Now comes the worst part. Okay, we're done. Um, <laughs> so we're out of time. Uh, no, go ahead. I imagine myself in my clinic seeing 20 patients a day. Again, I like it. So there comes like, doctors are resistant. Doctors are not resistant. It's the immunity to change. And immunity to change is a different concept. It's the com competition with other tasks. Yeah. Uh, we have the other questionnaires. Yeah. So now we have to put this new questionnaire on the table. Um, and it's still, you know, I like it. So I, I'm going to make it happen. Um, but then I went into the future. <sighs> like if we are moving into population health and we're going to have a team, um, it made more sense, I'm gonna add more value because um, I will be able to use the information if I try to keep the patient away from the clinic, right, to bring the patient here. The reason is because I have an agenda, you know, diagnostic and, and treatment, and the administration may have another agenda, all these questions at Jaco, and the patient may have another agenda, and the doctor who sent me the patient to me has another agenda. So I have to address all these agendas, and I have to prioritize in order to stay within the time, like you are doing today, trying to keep us within the time at 4.30. Mm -hmm. Yep, that, that's the challenge, right? You know, um, there's only so much flexibility that busy clinicians have to, to do the things they want. <laughs> Thank you for your time and questions and being a fun audience. Um, uh, I hope you, enjoyed, just speaking as division head, I hope you enjoyed your, your time here. Um, I've heard nothing but good things about you, and I've heard from some of you that you've enjoyed your experience. Um, I mean, the people I talk, everybody I talk to enjoyed their experience, not just like some of them liked it and some of them didn't. So I hope you enjoyed your time in wonderful Minnesota. If you're not from Minnesota, you're welcome. Um, uh, it makes it easier to study hard. Uh, thank you for choosing this program. Um, uh, it's just wonderful. Again, as I said to the incoming cohort on Saturday, um, I just realized more and more what a gem this is. You're going to leave here with um, a skill set that's unparalleled, um, that really sit situates you to be um, cutting edge um, on, on healthcare delivery uh, and systems, not only the finance, but um, other things as well. Um, like I said at the, the cohort, I came from Mayo Clinic, which the dyad model was just wonderful. Um, it made me look a lot better than I actually am. Um, so you're going to have skills not only to understand the business, but also think strategically and problem solve and, and a, a toolkit of heuristics that you can deploy every day to, to um, address some of the huge challenges that are known in, in, on the fu in the future. So thank you for coming here. Thank you for spending time with me today and enjoy the balance of your time here. <laughs>